नम शिवाय ओम नम शिवाय ओम नम शिवाय ओम नम शिवाय नमस्ते Oh, this is so blissful. Anyway, I want to pick up where we left off yesterday, talking about Upamanyu's qualifications. Why is Upamanyu chosen to recite the Shiva Sahasranama in the assembly around Grandfather Bhishma's departure? I mean, really, this is like the climax this is like the crown jewel of mahabharata really the whole bhishma parva but especially the shiva sahasranama in fact it's given twice once by upamanyu and once by krishna in a, in a later chapter so uh, there's something special about shiva sahasranama and there's something special about upamanyu that Upamanyu heard these names directly from Shiva. See, this distinguishes him from all the other people there. I mean, everybody was there. <laughs> Brahma, Vishnu in the form of Krishna, and Shiva and Parvati were there, and, you know, so many demigods and sages, even Vyasadeva, who's the most senior sage of all, because he's an incarnation of Vishnu. So <laughs> they were all apparently senior to Upamanyu, but why was he chosen? See, this has to do with the principle of parampara. Parampara means hearing from authorities through the chain of disciplic succession. So... Seniority in spiritual life is not determined by, you know, your position in some organization <laughs> or your title or, you know, uh, anything external. You know, how long you can stand on your head. <laughs> yeah. These are not the qualification. The qualification is from whom you have heard and how well you have heard. This is called Shru Shru Shubish, uh, the quality of hearing. So, by the quality of hearing, Upamanyu was see here. <laughs> he was more devoted, he was more purified, more enlightened <clears throat> about the nature of Shiva than anyone else present. So, he got to recite these thousand names. Let's take this up again where we left off yesterday. Yatta drahasyam paramam brahma proktang sanatanam bakshe yadukula sreshta shrinu shvabahito mama All of them are fraught with the element of truth. With those names I shall adore him who is Supreme Brahman, who has been declared unto the universe by the Vedas, and who is eternal. O chief of Yadu's race, I shall now tell you those names. Please hear them with rapt attention. I want to explain these names a little better. These verses refer to each name, all the names, as having truth. Not just truthiness, huh? but real truth. Well, what is truth? Truth is that which never changes. See, this is why Brahman is the absolute truth, because Brahman is changeless. It has no boundaries, no qualities, no activities. Huh? So how can it change? It has no dimensions. It can't be measured. Can't be even conceived by the mind or explained by words. See, so all of these things mean it's beyond change. It's beyond alteration, transformation, and so on. 
So then, uh, what is the truth? Well, the truth are the words that refer to Brahman, either directly, Nirguna Brahman, or indirectly, Saguna Brahman. Brahman without qualities in its original state, or Brahman that has qualities, apparently has qualities, which uh, cover it, its original nature. But still, that never changes. That original nature of Brahman is always the same. So that is the real truth upon which all other truths are based. And these thousand and eight names of Shiva are permeated with that truth. Now the next line. Paratvena bhavam devam bhaktastvam parameshvaram Chena te shravanishyami yatad brahma sanatanam You are a devoted worshipper of the Supreme Deity. Worship the illustrious Baba, distinguishing him above all the deities. Mahadev is eternal Brahman, and because you are devoted to him, I shall therefore recite those names in your hearing. With these names I shall adore him who is the supreme Brahman. And here he actually begins <laughs> chanting the names of Shiva, because him who is the supreme Brahman is Brahma Poktang. Brahma Poktang means identical with Brahman, same as equivalent to. So in this way, Shiva is identified very first thing as being the supreme Brahman, identical with the Supreme Brahman. And then what does he say? Who has been declared unto the universe by the Vedas? In other words, without the Vedas, there is no way to know the Absolute. Why? Because we are in duality. We are in conditioned existence, conditioned consciousness. So we cannot be directly conscious of anything without qualities. And actually, we learn in Vedanta and uh, in Advaita philosophy that this self of all, Brahman, is also the self of us. <laughs> we are that self. But in our present form, we are covered with so many upadis. And the upadis principally are five. The Ananda Maya Kosha, which is consciousness. The Vijnana Maya Kosha, which is intelligence at will. The Mano Maya Kosha, which is the mind and thoughts. The Prana Maya Kosha, which is energy, living energy. And finally, the Anamaya Kosha, the material body and senses. So all these coverings delude us, and we start to think that I am that. I am that body. I am that mind. I am this life energy. I am these thoughts, and so on. And then finally, the last trap is I am consciousness. Consciousness is of four flavors. We've been over this a million times. <laughs> Jagrat. Waking consciousness, svapna, dreaming consciousness, sushupti, deep sleep, and turiya, the fourth. Why is it simply called the fourth? Because it's indescribable. It's inconceivable. And it's also eternal. It's our basic nature. And the other three states of consciousness actually cover turiya and depend upon turiya. Because Turiya is pure, unconditioned awareness. The other three states are conditioned. And the proof of that is that they change. Right now, I'm in, or we are all, in external consciousness, Jagrat consciousness, uh, looking at the phone or the computer as a separate object from myself. 
So this is Jagrat Consciousness, Jagrat Chaitanya, and it is the default state assumed by all the Vedas, because after all, if you're reading the Vedas, that means you're in Jagrat. But it is also considered an Upadi, because the truth is there are not separate individuals. There is only the Supreme Self. But the Supreme Self apparently becomes covered. And this is called avyaya or superimposition, like the rope that gets covered with the concept of the snake. The snake has nothing to do with the rope. The snake is not part of the rope. The snake is simply a concoction, simply a fabrication, and is projected onto the rope. And in the same way, we project the other states of consciousness on Turiya. And that gives rise to the so-called reality, the existence or the experience that we have in life. But the real self is not the experience. It's the experiencer. It's not the seeing. It's the seer. See, it's not the object. It's the watcher, the knower. It's not the doer, even. It's just he who watches, he who experiences, the one, the self. This is Brahman. So this is really the object of all these thousand and eight names. And in the beginning, Upamanyu identifies Shiva with Brahman, who has been declared unto the universe by the Vedas, because unless we got a clue, from the Vedas, we would never guess. We would never be able to observe all this. <clears throat> because in the default state of consciousness, Jagrat, this is unobservable. It's only becoming observable to those who, first of all, know these ontological categories, the different states of consciousness, different states of being, absolute versus relative, and so on. Huh? Advaita versus Dvaita. Non-duality is the reality. <laughs> Everything else is Maya. So he talks again to Krishna, Oh, chief of Yadu's race, I shall now tell you these names. Please hear them with rapt attention. He's speaking, he's addressing Madhava, he's addressing Krishna. But actually, he's speaking to everyone because he knows Krishna has already heard these names from him. And Krishna has an eidetic memory. He never forgets anything. In fact, he already knew those names. <laughs> but in the drama of the world, of the Leela, the pastimes, he pretends to be Upamanyu's student in the matter of Shiva's thousand names. But now, in the next verse... He's going to begin describing Shiva by use of certain names. And let's see what they are. Nashakyang vistarat kritsnang vaktung sharvasya kena chit yuktena api vibhuti nam api varsha shatairapi. Even though one has all abilities and fame, it is just impossible for them to narrate completely the greatness of Shiva, even in a hundred years. He says, Paratwina Paktang Twam, you are a realized devotee. And he's really, he's speaking to everyone present. They were all great souls, every single one of them. And uh, that's why this is really the uh, crown jewel, the chintamani, the wish-fulfilling gem of Mahabharata. And if one reads through this or recites it or hears about it, the benefits are just amazing. I mean, they're incalculable, really. Uh, this is given in Shiva Purana. You know, good old Shiva Purana. You watched it, right? <laughs> so, anyway, he goes on to say, Worship 
Bhava. Bhava means Shiva. But Bhava also means becoming or being. Huh? Being and becoming are the same thing. Because everything that has being, everything that exists in the world, is constantly changing. So it's always becoming. It never stops changing. Uh, even in death, the body continues to change and gradually disappears, you know, is eaten by worms or whatever, you know. And then those elements go back into the earth. Everything is constantly churning, constantly burning. Buddha says in one of his suttas, this world is burning. Uh, the body is burning. The mind is burning, he says. So what does that mean? That means it's going through these changes of oxidation as far as the material body is concerned. Did you ever see an old house, an old derelict building, and all the, the roof tiles are coming off and the shingles are coming off the walls and so on? That's because of oxidation. The relentless wear and tear of sun and rain and wind and changes in temperature and bacteria and whatever. Huh? Literally, it's being eaten up by the elements. So this is bhava. This is bhava. Becoming and being. It means burning. It means changing. It means constant transformation, constant motion. This is life. As soon as that motion stops, the life is finished, isn't it? So he is all that. Worship him as above all other deities, Upamanyu is saying. Why? Because this is the principle that drives all the other deities. I mean, consider Brahma and Vishnu. Nobody much worships Brahma. <laughs> Because he was chastised by Shiva in the beginning of the creation. Uh, but uh, Brahma is nevertheless very important and powerful and is present in everything. But because he's the creator, he's in the mode of passion, Rajaguna, then he's always changing, always moving, never the same. And the same with Vishnu. Brahma and Vishnu are charged with the creation and maintenance of the material universe. That means they have to care about the material universe. They have to believe in the material universe. They have to think it's real. Or how could they do their jobs? How could they perform their functions? Only Shiva, who incarnates as Rudra, and whose function is to destroy the material creation. You know, I, this is why I, I got an insight. Uh, this is why Brahma is envious of Rudra. I think unconsciously he knows Rudra is going to undo everything I do. Everything I create, he's thinking like this, subconsciously. Everything I create is going to be destroyed at the end of the Mahakalpa. By who? This same Rudra. Huh? So uh, that's why he's occupied or obsessed with identifying Rudra as his child, as his son, because Rudra was born from Brahma's third eye. When he became angry with the four Kumaras, when they didn't want to become a prajapatis, progenitors, and engage in procreation. So uh, he became so angry, Rudra was born from his forehead. Because this is the thing about Brahma. Brahma has this power of bhava. And the same with Vishnu. Vishnu is maintaining the universe. How? By the power of Shiva. Lakshmi is given to him as a shakti. And Lakshmi is actually wealth. All the wealth, all the uh, material elements that make up the universe belong to Vishnu. And they take form and shape on Vishnu's will. That's how he maintains the universe. 
So he is very much connected with all the material elements, and so is Brahma, right? Only Shiva is detached. Only Shiva is like, well, yeah, I'm going to have to destroy all this anyway. <laughs> so he doesn't really care, you know. He can go into samadhi for, you know, centuries or millennia at a stretch, or he can come out and, and uh, make love with Parvati for centuries or millennia at a stretch, you know. It doesn't affect him either way. He is always the greatest, always the supreme, always Brahman. Aum Tatsat. Aum Shakti Aum. Aum Namah Shivaya.